setting up your Facebook. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Oh. You're glowing. Oh, wait, no, you're not. Okay. Waiting to see if we're live. It says it is. We're live. Here we go. Hi, everybody out there in Facebook land. This is Kathy Beal from Empowerment Unlimited with my friend, Heather E. Quinlan, actually in real life friend. We live driving distance from each other. And I am very, very happy that Heather is talking to us this evening. Uh, she has written what has turned out to be a very timely book entitled Plagues, Pandemics and Viruses from the Plague of Athens to COVID-19. And you're seeing it backwards because Facebook has uh, Zoom has mirrored my video, even though I think I told you. Uh, it that. looks it looks fine to me. Looks fine to you, yay! Okay, then it that's excellent. Um, I am while I look to find out where we are so that I can watch the uh, chat. Um, there we go. Uh, tell us what inspired you to write this book. Well, I really wanted to write a book uh, specifically on the Black Death. And I had met uh, the publisher. Uh, his name is Roger Janicki, and the publishing house is Visible Ink Press. And uh, their books tend to be pretty, uh, uh, pretty lengthy. Uh, this was 400 pages. So he said, I like the idea, but I don't think 400 pages is, is a bit much for just the Black Death. So what about the whole span of pandemics. And I thought, well, yeah, I mean, I hadn't considered that. Uh, and it gave me an opportunity not only to learn about uh, the biology and what causes them, but also how they affect people, geography, economics, all, all, all different kinds of things that you don't normally think of. And sometimes ultimately for the better, not always, I mean, at the time, yes, for the worst, but, you know, there's a lot that uh, can, good that can come out of pandemics and the plague. Which is, which is my point. I'll just tell everybody while I was reading the book, and I have read the entire book, it's very accessible. And Thank parts you. of it are actually kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> it's easy reading. You wouldn't think it would be, but it is. Uh, when I got into the chapter about the Black Death, I was really struck by the parallels between what happened during that ec epidemic and what is happening now, to an extent, and then the par and then what happened afterwards and how much the world changed. And we're at a pivot point now between a way of being and another way of being. And this fits in with my little bailiwick, which is, of course, astrology. But we're moving from, we're going from a massive period of being shut down and deconstruction to a new construct. And it seems to me there's, there are parallels in many of the diseases that you write about between them and what is happening now. And so I was thinking perhaps we could project at least themes about what might be coming for uh, humanity at this point. Um, should we start with the, from the, with the Black Death? Sure. That seems to be the one that was the biggest. <laughs> good a point as any to start. <laughs> now, roughly when, roughly when was that? Uh, 1347. And uh, that was the Black Death that people know about lasted about four years. But then it came back uh, in successive waves every 10 years or so, but in, in, to a much lesser degree. And it had its own form of social distancing, but even more extreme than we're undergoing, right? Also, the Great Plague of London, uh, which was in the 1500s, uh, it really, when people talk about losing their uh, freedoms and their choices, 
we've lost our choices once this pandemic happened. The virus makes choices for us. And during the Great Plague of London, if you want to talk about like, if you were sequestered in your home, chances are um, you might have Netflix or you might have, you know, things to occupy your time. Back then they had what were called um, watchers and they were women who were on the dole who were hired by the city of London. Basically it was like, since we're paying you, you might as well work. And uh, if you don't, then you'll have your welfare taken away. So these were uh, widows and they could be anywhere from, you know, 20 to however old. Uh, usually they were women in good standing. Um, so they were people that the government could trust and this was the thanks they got. But their job was to go from house to house and uh, when they found when they heard that someone was sick and see if plague was on the horizon and if they diagnosed plague then the house was shut down for 40 days uh and the guards were put uh on outside so they couldn't leave they were fed through the window and after 40 days the doors were opened and they were uh let out if everyone was okay or if everyone was dead then they were let out on a wheelbarrow or whatever. So imagine being locked inside with your family, um, your dying family perhaps, uh, and unable to leave. And those were the circumstances that people were under back then, which wasn't all that long ago. Um, and I dare say a lot of people are still living in the same circumstances in London back then, the rich were allowed to leave in a lot of the ways that the, the rich are, were fleeing the cities for in New York for the Hamptons or uh, wherever uh, the rich go to. Um, and um, the same thing happened there. The rich were allowed to leave, but the poor were thought that, uh, that they almost like physically had plague within their souls, almost like they were infected people, beings. So uh, they were not allowed to leave. And in fact, there were guards that uh, would kill them if they did try to leave. So um, the fact that COVID now uh, infects such a large number of poor people and people who I feel like are living in conditions that aren't too different than from right around even the dark ages. Social distancing was actually even even worse during the Black Death, didn't you? Didn't you say that people were actually boarded up into their houses? You were nailed into your house, so there was no way you could get out. Well, that that was uh, th they had that in some places. Uh, the Great Plague of London was when they were nailed up in their houses. It, that but uh, but yeah, in uh, Ragusa, it was known as Ragusa then. It's uh, in Croatia now, I believe is uh, when they came up with the idea of a quarantine. Um, and uh, so you were uh, sequestered for 30 days. And Ragusa was one of the places that, although it got hit, uh, Italy and uh, its uh, surrounding areas got hit very, very hard because of all the trade that went on in Italy being a peninsula, Sicily being an island, it being uniquely situated between uh, you know uh, Western Asia and uh, you know Western Europe, um, uh, but Ragusa Dubrovnik is what it's known as now. Um, they were able to really ride out the plague because they did take part in this in this quarantining, and people were people really uh, as a whole in a lot of places. Uh, followed the instructions because they didn't want to spread disease. They didn't exactly know how it was spread. Um, they knew, it was, they felt like it was spread through air, but they thought it was spread through smelly air. It's known as miasma. So, uh, you know, people who worked in, in, in smelly jobs, for instance, like fat rendering or grave diggers or something like that were thought to be, you know, uh, much more at risk, but um, they did know that there was some way that it was communicative. They just weren't exactly sure how. Um, but given the lack of 
technology they had back then, um, the microscope wasn't really invented until around 1700. Um, that they were they were pretty sharp people, in that respect. Um, I noticed that there are there are certain threads uh, or, or, or common themes in in responses, and one of them is this is distancing or quarantining. Um, that uh, public gatherings, theaters, universities, pubs, things like that were shut down during the uh, plagues of London and during the Spanish flu, 1918 and 1919, at least in DC, there were also shutdowns of certain types of, certain types of clusters of where people would go. Um, according to your book, uh, schools, colleges closed, Congress and the Supreme Court closed. Um, weren't there some changes in how food would get distributed? Changes in how food would get distributed. Uh, for during example, the, in, in any of these, during, in, for example, during the Black Death, wasn't there in Italy, during the plague, wasn't there in Italy uh, a, a trend where, uh, I don't know if it was a tavern owner or what you would call it, would actually cut little holes in the wall for, for to sell wine and push it out the holes. And I understand on like a, some morning show recently showed that these are now being used again to sell wine in Italy. Well, you know, uh, Italy uh, never let it, an Italian be stopped from selling wine. Um, I think when it came to the Black Death, a lot of things were shut down because everyone died. Uh, I mean, I, that was the reason for that. It, there were basically three forms of uh, plague that you can get uh bubonic and if you got bubonic you had a, a, a small chance of surviving um pneumonic which you were going to die from and septicemic which you were really going to die from uh so chances are you were going to die um so all these different places uh you know the structures collapsed um in some places uh, like uh, Florence, for instance, that uh, prided itself on, well, first of all, it, it had, um, a, a, it, was, it was built on banking. So it was a very wealthy uh, city, obviously, but it also prided itself on uh, its arts. And it had all these guilds, which were essentially unions for artisans to belong to. Um, and they put a lot of money into uh, rejuvenating their city after they were hit really hard by plague, but they recognized the need for people in the city, um, for people to come in. So they had, um, they used their money to incentivize people to move to Florence. They also used the money to give women of marriageable age uh, an attractive dowry so that they could literally repopulate the city. Um, and uh, so things like that happened. Um, when the Black Death occurred, uh, you know, it hit Western Europe largely. It, 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 it started in uh, the Far East and it uh, went through the trade routes. It went through the Silk Road, which you know was a famous uh, trade route that went from the Far East through the Middle East, and uh, you know ended in Europe. And um, so, some of uh, the plague stretched through this uh, Silk Road, but it really hit hard in Western Europe. And Western Europe, <clears throat> excuse me, at the time. There were three, um, for most of Western Europe, three states that you could belong to, or three estates. There was the clergy, there was the nobility, and there was everyone else. And uh, the clergy and the nobility were like what today would be our 1%. And uh, everyone else were the people who worked the land, uh, had uh, you know, uh, blacksmiths, uh, those kinds of jobs. What happened was after <clears throat> the Black Death was over, 
and uh, the few people who were still left standing, um, there were still nobility. Uh, they now had fewer people to work the land. So those who were still available to work the land for them and to make a profit for them by growing food and so that they could sell it, there were far fewer people. <clears throat> so these people were like, okay, I'll grow food for you if you pay me more. Um, if you're the only blacksmith within a hundred miles now, because all the other ones are dead, they're like, okay, well, I'll shoe your horses if you pay me more. So all of a sudden, these people who never had any chance, this, these were not estates that you could move back and forth through. If you were poor, you were poor, and that was it. Um, you just had a, you know, hope for, you know, after you die, you go to heaven. That, that's what, you know, helped you go on. Um, and that's another thing that the Black Death changed was the idea of uh, the church, but. Um, yeah, I want to get to that. Yeah. But you're talking so, about there was, a, there was an economic restructuring that there occurred. Was a, there was suddenly a middle class. There was suddenly a group of people who uh, had money, and not only that, had disposable money that they could then spend on things like art um, and food and things that they could never spend it on. And thus began uh, the Renaissance. So a, a re, um, realignment of economic power was one mm -hmm. one out, out aftermath. Uh, feudalism died also. Feudalism as a, as a... died, and that had been around for centuries. That was not going to go away unless something cataclysmic happened, and it did. Okay, so this is um, this is big theme number one, folks. Pay attention to this economic power restructuring. Okay. Uh, and then you mentioned the, uh, the the church. Okay, so the people, there had been this major authority. The church ruled basically everything and people lost faith after the Black Death, right? Sure, I mean, uh, <clears throat> the church was, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I have a frog in my throat. I'm fine, by the way. Um, the church ruled everything. There was no separation of church and state that wasn't even thought of. Uh, everything was uh, the Pope <laughs> made the decisions about all sorts of laws. So, um, and everyone put their total faith uh, in the Pope and that the Pope was basically had a direct line to God. So when the Pope couldn't stop this from happening um, and when the Pope himself, he, he, he didn't die uh, from uh, plague, but uh, it didn't stop where he, where the Pope was, the Pope wasn't in Italy, Back then he was in Avignon in France and Avignon again very badly hit by plague so you would think where the Pope is would be you know uh, immune uh, you know uh, God granted immunity or something but there wasn't so people were like well what's going on why can't uh, you know our prayers aren't working uh, the Pope can't do anything um, what have we been like putting all our faith and our hope in all these years what have we been tithing over um, so again, another thing that uh, that brought about eventually, you know, the Protestant Reformation and Martin, Lu Martin Luther um, and the Protestant thought about how <clears throat> the Catholic Church being um, basically a uh, uh, money hungry, uh, power hungry institution and not speaking for God and not uh, in the not there to help people. And so, another thing real quick, I'll just tell you, no, no, yeah, because a lot of priests died and the clergy were made up of wealthy people who spent years learning how to be priests and to minister to the sick. And because so many of them died, they drafted a lot of men who had no training, really only took the job so they could have a job. It wasn't a calling for them. Um, and basically they were terrible priests. They were, you know, they didn't know how to priest. They didn't know how to do it. And then, you know, they'd run off eventually because it wasn't a calling for them. It, it was, uh, it was a job. And then it was, they realized, shit, I hate this job. So, um, that was it. So bad priests, uh, you know, ineffective Pope, uh, deaf God. Um, there you have it. So a big theme number two and maybe three, uh, a, a collapse of what had been the institutional power for that time and uh, 
circumstances opening up for people to have more of a direct link, a, a shift in thinking, a shift in thinking about God, a shift in thinking about power, a shift in thinking about personal, what you could do as a person. That's kind of a theme in this, the individual gaining a little bit more maneuverability seems to me oh that's yeah there was no such thing as individuality i dare yeah. say there wasn't really any such thing as individual individuality until the baby boom era but definitely uh definitely not then although uh they start they did start thinking that way I, and i and i won't say you know they were down on the church altogether as an institution but it was it it, it did start an anti-catholic anti-papacy way of thinking um that uh was very much alive you know once henry the eighth um became king and that's a whole but other to, to uh, universalize it beyond somebody else's power grab right, right. exactly <laughs> yes but to universalize it beyond that it also was a a splintering of the notion of there being one one uh ownership of mm -hmm. of thought one ownership of god sure sure okay. yeah so yeah you know, this, this could be this could be a, a theme and issue um the role of healthcare that's a change something in all in everything i read the role of medicine and healthcare went through evolutionary shifts in the in the plague during the plague years hospitals change the role of the hospital changed right well, there weren't, uh, you know, hospitals per se, as we know them, uh, didn't really exist back then. Um, I think where the huge shift came was there was a lot, people don't realize that uh, pre-ancient Rome, pre-ancient Greece, there was a lot of uh, uh, learning and reading and writing um about medicine in within groups like uh the arabic community the jewish community uh maimonides was a famous jewish uh physician that they have that ho big hospital in brooklyn named after him um and they were sort of the leading figures in medical thought at the time and um then when um hippocrates uh, uh, came around and Galen was almost a contemporary of his in ancient Rome, the Roman version of Hippocrates. Um, they uh, launched a, a, a new wave of medical thought, which had to do with what we would hear about in history school as, you know, the humors of, uh, you know, you had these four humors um that were within your body and they had to be balanced and if they were out of balance then that is what made you sick and that's what led to uh, the, the bleeding they were always big on bleeding people um another one was collar uh um i'm trying to think of what another one was is blood collar uh bile and uh the fourth is escaping me it also led to vocabulary where it's like bilious um choleric choleric um and uh things like that so um so yeah that way of thinking more or less because there was no like i said technology uh to see things like bacteria or viruses um that way of thinking basically lasted up until uh the 17 1800s so we were using uh, a medical uh, structure, uh, laws, rules, some of which worked, some of which didn't, but that were a thousand years old. And they didn't really have the, uh, the ability to, uh, to, to go beyond that. They could only go so far with what they had. Um, and Things like observing uh, a patient, learning from a patient were, were things that evolved too over the years. But um, yeah, it would be like us using the same medical knowledge as people did during uh, you know, the Battle of Hastings. So that's what you're talking about when you're talking about you know, um, uh, how healthcare changed. Well, it, it, it took a long time not through any stupidity of people, but just uh, it took a long time to develop 
um, this machinery combined with the way of thinking that uh, led to the uh, medicine today as we know it. So well, I saw thousand years tips. of of the same of the same processes, more or less, um, until uh, you know you get to the era of Pasteur and um, hand washing, which and comes hand back washing. To yes. uh, oh, but uh, I, I do have something to say yeah. about hand washing. Okay. Um, the Jewish community was uh, um, what's the word uh, during the Black Death. Uh, a lot of people uh, blame the Black Death on Jews, and there were several reasons for this. One, because the Jewish community were always outsiders, so people were always suspicious of outsiders. Two, uh, the Jewish people were involved in um, loans, and a lot of people owed a lot of uh, Jewish merchants money, so uh, it would be easier to kill them rather than pay it back. Um, and three, Jewish law stated that you had to wash your hands after every time you use the bathroom. So they were more hygienic than non-Jews and less likely to get sick from plague. And so these three things put uh, together led to a large number of massacring of Jewish communities throughout Europe. It's, uh, you know, the same story told over and over again. This is exactly one of them. So yeah, it just goes to show too, hand washing uh, is good for not spreading disease, uh, bad for uh, <laughs> keeping people from being suspicious of you, I guess. I don't know, especially in the 1300s. Um, one thing I, I noticed that I, I traced out in, in your uh, telling of these various uh, epidemics. I did. I did see gear shifts in how in the approach to healing. It seemed that uh, one of the aftermaths of the Black Death was uh, to actually look at healing rather than just parking somebody in a place. You you talk about uh, a charity home giving way to actually having a place of healing. So that that seemed to be one and. Uh, there was a change to a change in the approach to medicine during the plagues of London, seemed to me, uh, and that uh, the Spanish flu of 1918 to 1919, that area, seemed to uh, push for or spur on the development of public health systems in ways that hadn't happened before in the U.S. or actually around the world. Uh, there were a couple things that. Uh... Uh, brought about changes in, in the public health system. One is um, uh, when there was a cholera outbreak uh, in London in, um, I believe, the 1700s. And a man named John Snow, of all things, um, was able to track down the cholera outbreak to a single water pipe in one corner of London. And people didn't believe them because they were still had that belief that uh, disease was carried through bad air. And so they felt like uh, people who, again, grave diggers were more likely to get sick than the average person. But uh, the grave diggers in that area were using water from another pump. So they actually weren't getting sick. Um, even so people once they get an idea in their head, it's very hard to get people to change that way of thinking. And what Jon Snow said is that there is basically, not basically, there is fecal matter in the water that people are drinking. And people back then were essentially like, ew, that's disgusting. I don't want to know about it, you sick weirdo. Um, and Jon Snow is like, well, you know, you, you, you don't have to believe it, but it's true. And it was true. And uh, it basically came down to a woman had used the water pump to clean uh, her baby's uh, diaper. And that matter had gotten, uh, the bacteria from that had infected essentially that water pipe. Um, and so uh, 
every year they have like a big uh john snow water pipe festival where uh they celebrate the uh the changing of the water pipe for that so that's one instance where public health was changed that um these things were checked and uh made sure that they were clean that people realized that uh, learned that it was bacteria and not miasma it, the Spanish flu is interesting in that it's very similar in a lot of ways to what we're going through right now. First of all, you know, uh, a lot of people call this the Chinese flu. Well, it does seem that it did originate in China, but I mean, you can call it whatever you want. Again, the virus doesn't care. The Spanish flu had nothing to do with Spain, just as we've learned that Hilaria Baldwin had nothing to do with Spain. Um, uh, the Spanish flu uh, was <laughs> was only given that name because uh, World War I was happening at the same time. Uh, the American press, as well as the other press from other countries that were involved in World War I were embargoed and not allowed to write about uh, the flu, but Spain was neutral. And so Spain did publicize uh, stories about the flu or did write about the flu. Um, their king even caught the flu, uh, uh, although he survived. Um, so uh, uh, as a thank you, the flu was given the name the Spanish flu. Again, uh, a certain amount of otherness, exoticness to Spain um, that uh, you know made uh, this illness seem sort, sort of foreign and different and whereas it might have actually started in Kansas. We're not really sure where it began. Um, it did travel like wildfire uh, through these different uh, military bases because you had a lot of men who were coming from different parts of the country, some of whom you know, had never really left their hometown and they were coming together in these in these uh, bases, these army bases or military bases, and uh, so it's already sort of a petri dish of uh, germ exchange, almost like kindergarten. Um, but then you know, add a, a rampant, extremely deadly flu on top of that. Bring these men overseas, where again they're coming across even other men who they would never ever have. I mean, their chances are they would have might have come across some of these men in America, but definitely not in, you know, in Germany or wherever the fighting was taking place. Um, so you had uh, a, a major major uh, explosion of this illness uh, that nobody wanted to talk about. Most of all, the president uh, Woodrow Wilson because he uh, ran uh, for re-election on the platform that he wasn't gonna send our boys overseas. And that's precisely what he did. Um, so in order to get people's buy-in for doing that, um, he did not wanna hear about it. Sort of like Trump, it's like, if, if I don't talk about it, it'll go away. If I don't, la, 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 la. And uh, like Trump, uh, Wilson himself got the flu as well. And it affected a lot of uh, what he came up with for how to deal with Germany after World War I. Um, can you uh, think of, um, well, there are, there are things that, that people point to about the stuff that happened because somebody went into quarantine, developments that occurred, discoveries that were made. Uh, this is shifting gear radically here. Um, Isaac Newton got out of London. He had the money to get out of London. He went to his family's land. In a country home somewhere, yeah. Somewhere. And he developed during his downtime. Oh, just like, you know, the theory of gravity and calculus, you know, just a couple things. Just a couple things that kind of changed thought, the way thought is going. Exactly. Uh, are there any other examples you can think of? Uh, I, I hear things about Shakespeare, but I'm not sure they're true, uh, that Shakespeare wrote a bunch of plays during... Well, uh, Shakespeare wrote uh, a lot about syphilis uh, in varying degrees, and so people sometimes think he doth protest too much that he himself may have had it. Um, 
uh, and venereal diseases in general, he was very big on. Uh, it's, uh, it's funny, venereal diseases are a, a great epithet uh, going back to, in the Bible, in certain translations, uh, Moses, I believe through his, his brother used to speak for him because Moses had a stutter, I believe. Um, but uh, for, for the Jews who didn't follow him, he uh, cursed them with the boils of Egypt. Uh, uh, so you can figure out what that is. And I think it even went so far in some translations as, as you know, basically, may you get the boils of Egypt where you poop from. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, that's not quite calculus. Um, but, um, no, I mean, those were, that was the biggest, uh, you know, not too many Isaac Newtons come around. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there was literature that was, uh, created, uh, during the time of the Black Death, like the Decameron, um, that way of writing, the Canterbury Tales, um, basically storytelling with the characters being the storytellers, to Cameron being very similar to the Canterbury Tales and that these are people who are spending time, um, at least in the Decameron, uh, uh, during the Black Death uh, away, they're away in their country estates in Italy, um, biding their time by telling stories. So, um, that was a, a, a way of storytelling that uh, was relatively new, um, thanks to the Black Death. So I, I see in, in what you've talked about in, and in what I read in your book, I see some recurring themes that are possibilities that could be happening, outgrowths of what we're experiencing right now. Oh, so from the social shutdowns, changes in thought, changes in, in uh, discoveries, who knows what kinds of views of reality, new theories, new forms of creativity are going to come out of this. I have seen actually some TV shows openly confronting it, addressing it, being very um, immediately topical, like Black-ish, which also deals with voting and stuff it's just like mm -hmm. what is this show my god these people are actually talking about life uh not sitcom stuff um but more bigger ones there's a an ongoing theme of a change in economic systems and uh, we do have a situation now with a huge concentration of wealth among a very very small number of people and then the businesses going out of business, long-standing ways of doing things, just collapsing. We don't know what's going to happen to theater, to film, to museums, to public education, um, universities, funding issues, uh, but massive commercial change, chains going bankrupt, going bankrupt, going out of business, things that have been in our tapestry of reality for a long, long, long time. So I, I would, would seem to me that big shifts in, if not distribution of wealth, at least opportunity for creating it could be growing out of this. And I will say that astrologically, in we have stuff coming up that tracks to the time of the New Deal. Wow. So that would, that's a, I mean, interesting parallel happening here. So who knows where that is going to go. Uh, big changes. So another big theme, changes in attitude about authority in the way you think about authority. So that leading to the Reformation, uh, but the breakdown of the church structure. Uh, well, we, who knows where that's going in this world. We certainly see a lot of differing opinions in that front right now. And then changes in how, and then the approach to medicine and public health. Well, this pandemic has outpaced the ability of the health system to deal with it, at least at first. So I would say, I would think that it's very probable based on what has gone before that that will be another theme of what's coming. Uh, well, going back to what you said about uh, economics, 
-hmm. I find it extremely distressing to say the least how little anyone was prepared for something like this. Um, I feel like, and it's not just America, but we do have a certain uniqueness in our uh, view of ourselves in, in relation to the rest of the world um, by virtue of where we are. And uh, we are still isolated in a lot of ways from a lot of uh, the rest of the world. I blame the fact that we only get two weeks of vacation a year usually. And most of that is spent, you know, going to Disney World or, uh, you know, having to take it around the holidays. And so we don't really get the opportunity uh, to explore a lot of what's out there. Um, but uh, I can say from an American perspective, and I know this isn't just America, but uh, this is my country, so I can uh, speak more cogently about it. Um, people who are railing against authority and uh, want to keep their businesses open and uh, seem to be throwing these tantrums and hissy fits or whatnot, I don't blame them. They're losing their livelihood. And when you lose your livelihood, uh, chances are you are going to be very afraid and when people get afraid, a lot of times they get violent, they lash out. Um, and what I do blame is the fact that there are no checks and balances in place to take care of people if something catastrophic happened uh, to help them out, to bail them out. I know we had those, those loans earlier this year, but the way that this country has uh, evolved is yes, a huge number, uh, a huge amount of money is concentrated with a small number of people who are not in any position or, or not going to give it up. Um, and so you then do have not only the mom and pop stores and the restaurants and the theaters and all that uh, falling, uh, you know, by the wayside, but also you do have, uh, you know, uh, companies that or uh, organizations, uh, th whatever that uh, are going out of business that you never would have imagined, like, uh, I don't know, uh, JCPenney, uh, you know, all, all the uh, and all these stores, all these big stores closing down, Pier One, uh, who the hell knows what's going to happen with Macy's eventually, things like that. Um, so uh, my uncle was the mayor of New Fairfield, Connecticut for several years. It's a small town, uh, Western Connecticut on the border of New York State. And even they had a pandemic playbook. As, 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 as narrow as New Fairfield, Connecticut, they had a pandemic playbook that you do this, 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 and this if a pandemic should happen. It's almost like, you know, if uh, in case of fire, break glass, whatever, that kind of thing. For whatever reason, uh, now, my uncle was not mayor uh, during COVID, but all these playbooks were not followed, uh, whether they were not followed because of we lack strong leadership or people or they were out of date, or I don't know what the reason is. The lack of strong leadership that we have now is leading to uh, all this, all this uh, fear and the fear leads to violence and the violence leads to the looting. It leads to the protests. It leads to the spread of the disease. Um, it leads to people not wanting to, you know, uh, when, when the polio, when polio was, um, um, I, I don't know what the phrase is, when polio was rampaging through like say America and you had the March of Dimes and you had images of little kids on crutches, of course people, you're gonna get people's buy-in for that because who wants to watch little kids suffer? But um, in the case of COVID, people are losing their livelihood and they're losing their jobs and they're not getting the, the money that they need that this country has to give them, but for whatever reason, it cannot get its act together to do so. And um, also the wrong people are dying. It's the old and it's the poor. And uh, it's uh, respiratory disease, 
it, it's not getting you in the schwanz. It's not getting you, you know, uh, where it, it could hurt. Um, hot babes are not dying. Uh, strapping young men are not dying. Children, you know, it, it, not that they're not dying, but that's not the image that you have. You have essentially disposable people who are dying. So why do I have to go to the poorhouse over this when I am perfectly fine and everyone around me seems to be perfectly fine? And um, so I would say the 1918 flu took the best and the brightest. For whatever reason, we still don't exactly know why, but the majority of the people who died were young and healthy. Um, with COVID, uh, you know, obviously a large number of people who are dying from it are older or have underlying conditions, are poor, are minorities, are all these uh, different types of populations that aren't the sexy ones, um, that aren't the ones that tug at the heartstrings, that tug at people's uh, purse strings. It's the wrong kind of people. It's, it, and, and so that's why you're seeing all this different anger, fury, sadness, um, and lack of financial help for a lot of them. I go back to Florence being that banking city. They knew what they had to do and they spread the wealth and they used that money and they didn't go bankrupt doing it. They used that money to better their city and the people in it and it worked. And even down to dowries. And uh, I wish I could say the same for the US. Well, I will say, that a, a financial restructuring is a very likely outgrowth, not next month, but ultimately Here, I'll coming, do grips, <laughs> coming to grips with the impact this has had on, uh, because so much is getting hit. Uh, it would fit, it would fit astrologically and it would fit just based on what history shows us. So that's where it all dovetails for me. Here's hoping. And uh, so I'm looking, uh, I'm looking at the chat. Hold on. There was a, a comment about hand washing. Um, Dr. James Miranda Barry brought hand washing into public awareness. She was the woman who lived her life as a man. Yes, it's true. Uh, we have hi from Australia. Lots of people I know. Okay. Well, there are not questions, so. But I'll say hello. <laughs> hello, Australia. Good day. <laughs> it's the morning, I guess. <laughs> it is the morning here. Well, uh, thank you. This was encyclopedic. We covered a lot. Is there, uh, and, and I'm not seeing any specific questions being, being posted, but uh, my basic reaction remains the same, which is each of these really big, periods of time of massive disease caused social change that 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 hit um oh uh, yeah someone's making a political point that is accurate but i'm not going <laughs> to conversation um but each of these times um uh had uh developments during the during the illnesses that led to intellectual growth or rebirth or revitalization and then the periods afterwards led to changes in how we deal with disease and also with um economic and power restructuring well oh. there's the old saying if nothing changes nothing changes and that's just the way people are so it takes something enormous to uh, cause change, even if what the status quo is, is, is not great to get people to move out of that status quo. It, it, it takes something like a pandemic to be able to do so. And I would say the gear shift we're in now is about as great as going from pre-Black death to the Renaissance and the Reformation. Wow. Well, you know, one thing I will say is I really hope that uh, you, people take uh, climate change seriously because 
there are not only climate change, but encroaching on different um, areas of the world that maybe we shouldn't be in. Um, that uh, as uh, the writer of Spillover said, and I quoted in the book, uh, if you shake a tree, a bunch of viruses can fall out. Um, we just have no idea what's out there. Um, so that's my parting thought. <laughs> Be careful, don't overdevelop and uh, take climate change seriously and uh, we will be a healthier world for it. I agree. And there's one question here um, uh, that I will briefly address. Uh, there are several that are much bigger than I can have right now. Uh, but how can I see major change to happen for us now. Well, we have just gone from uh, a several year stretch of incredible deconstruction of old foundations, old institutions, old systems, as a lot of uh, outer planets have gone through the sign of Capricorn. And now we have the beginning of a new structure, a new construct, a new interaction with uh, the focus is going from institutions to the collective from institutions and power and government to what people can do what to a community response to a networking a future oriented response and that is from uh, Jupiter and Saturn now being in the sign of Aquarius it's not the age of Aquarius get that out of your head that's nothing to do with this so you're welcome to sing the song that would be fine with me uh, but now we we have really moved from one very old school way of being, and now we are forging a different way of dealing with each other, of connecting and a different sense of responsibility to and for everyone. That's all I'll say about that. I got tons more about this in all of my uh, forecasts and my talk about this year, all sorts of things at my site, empowermentunlimited.net. So um, thank you very very much and i thank everybody for uh and uh you can get the book uh, uh yes uh, i have a link i was promoting astoria bookshop uh for those of you in the new york area who know astoria queens they can uh really use your help they do carry my book um and if you are uh far away it is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, Target, um, or wherever great books are sold. I have the link in the description for the Facebook Live. I will also uh, put it when I post this on uh, YouTube. So great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thanks, Heather. Okay.